So I hope this is visible to everyone now. Yes. Yeah? Yes. Okay. All right, so I'll begin. <clears throat> uh, thanks a lot to everyone uh, for showing up today. Um, so among the different projects that I've worked on uh, during my PhD, um, this is the one that I've decided um, to talk about uh, for my final thesis defense. And it's about understanding visual camouflage detection. And the first question that we would like to ask is, uh, why do we want to understand camouflage detection? So camouflage detection is uh, a special uh, case of a broader category of problems that is seeing a lot of current interest, um, namely target detection or object recognition. But most object recognition research in uh, psychology or computer vision uses various cues. So here's an example. Um, down here, um, you can see that the ways that you can uh, separate out this target from the background is uh, by utilizing its differences from the background along various cues. So um, it's basically a task of segregating a scene into regions using differences in color, patterns, um, brightness, contrast, et cetera. Um, however, camouflage is interesting because it uh, evolved to deliberately uh, defeat um, this kind of detection using different cues. Um, so, uh, I mean, it, 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 it is a result of a kind of arms race between the animal that's trying to camouflage itself and the detection um, mechanisms of its predators and prey. Um, so, the phenomenon of camouflage is something that exists at the limit of detection. And so what it does is interestingly, it exposes um, uh, all, many of the different detection strategies that exist in the biological visual systems and kind of um, defines their limits. So I kind of like this quote, uh, there is hardly a law of vision that is not found again serving camouflage. So this is one of the reasons why it's interesting to look at camouflage because uh, it kind of uh, makes you encounter a lot of the different strategies that are used for detection and kind of helps you delineate what their uh, limits are. Okay, so um, uh, even though um, in best camouflage where um, the target is mimicking the exact um, luminance or brightness, contrast, color, and pattern of the background, for example, you can see this moth doing that. Even in such a case, um, it is possible in some cases to detect um, this target. So the question is, um, what is the available information in such a situation um, that can be used for camouflage detection? How is it processed? And when will detection be easy versus hard? Uh, Pranab, can I ask a question? Yeah, what, yeah. What exactly are we looking at in this repeating um, flashing thing you're showing us? Oh, so this is just an example of some uh, computer vision uh, images where you've just given a, uh, like a computational detector, probably some like machine learning algorithm, some images, and it has been trained on a lot of data. This is not my research. I'm just comparing the case of camouflage detection with a computer vision detection of objects where the objects have a lot of cues that are different from the background. So uh, the color is different, the pattern is different, contrast and luminance, et cetera, are different. So compared to um, a scenario like this, that in the top image, you see that the target and the background have the same color um, patterns, brightness and contrast. So I'm just contrasting camouflage detection with the kind of detection situations that are, have been heavily studied uh, in, let's say, the machine vision uh, research in current times. Um, okay, so, um, so these are the main questions that we want to ask. And um, hopefully, with the information that we get when we um, answer those questions, we'll be able to make a model to predict the human detection of camouflage objects in different scenarios. So a word about the scope of this uh, project. 
So what we want to do primarily is identify and quantify the cues or the pieces of information that exist in the image that are used for camouflage detection. And what are the plausible computations that happen on them um, to give rise to a final um, decision? Target exists or target does not exist. What we are not interested in or what is outside the scope of our current project is the neural implementation. So we, do, we are not gonna go into the details of how exactly does the brain implement um, uh, these computations at a granular level. So in our lab, for example, we don't directly go into the brain and make recordings of what the brain is doing. Um, so previous camouflage research, a lot of it has been about the ecology and description and kind of phenomenology of what different kinds of camouflage are like. And, but there has not been as much human detection measurements across different conditions or computational modeling of what is going on under the hood. Um, so this is a new area which calls for a kind of broad first foundation, which is what we will like um, to lay here. Uh, let's see. Okay, so, uh, but although this research is about human detection of camouflage, we should expect that some of these results should translate to other animals detecting camouflage because some of our visual system we have in common with other animals. Um, okay, so uh, this talk is going to be about an hour without questions, but I would actually like to invite um, questions that are clarificatory and kind of short clarificatory questions because it helps me feel like I'm not talking into a blank void. But if there are more like kind of conceptual or longer questions, uh, let's leave those until the end. Okay, so the first question is, uh, what is the kind of image that we will be using for our camouflage detection experiments? And this gives you an example of the camouflage stimulus that we're gonna be using in most of our human uh, detection experiments. Uh, first, I wanna talk a little bit about the texture that we're using here. So there are many different textures that one could choose to investigate. Uh, but we have chosen what is called pink noise, also called one over F noise. I want to describe a little bit about what this is. So the way that you generate one over F noise is you start with white noise. This is an example of two-dimensional white noise. Um, every pixel is completely independent of every other pixel. And then we affect a Fourier transform, and then we get its amplitude spectrum, which is the amplitudes of the different frequencies. And this is what the amplitude spectrum looks like for uh, white noise. Um, it's kind of noisy and like on average across many samples of white noise, it's flat across all of the different frequencies. So what we do with this amplitude spectrum is we multiply the amplitudes with the inverse of the frequency. So what that does is it makes, it really suppresses the amplitudes of the high frequency components and so the low frequency components become dominant. Um, and then we inverse Fourier transform it back. And what we get is called one over F noise or pink noise. So since the uh, long wavelengths are now more dominant, you see that this has now become a correlated texture. So its pixels have some spatial correlation and it's kind of smooth. So one of the reasons that we use this texture is that it is um, very quick and easy to uh, generate which is important because we need to generate many, many different samples of it um, to do analysis and to present images for an experiment. Um, it also has well-known statistical properties, which makes it pretty easy to do mathematical and computational analysis of different things, like what are the statistical properties that it has, what are the sources of information. Uh, another important reason is that this amplitude spectrum, which falls on average as one over F, is the same spectrum as natural images. So if you took natural images, it's images of nature, and you plotted their amplitude spectrum, it has been shown that on average, their amplitudes also fall off as one over the frequency. So pink noise has the same amplitude spectrum as natural images, but the phase spectrum is completely random. So the phases of each constituent um, wave is completely random. So, um, so pink noise for this, uh, reason is a good starting point for a study like this. And the conclusions that we can draw from um, studies on pink noise, we expect that quite a few of them should hold across other natural textures. 
Okay, so uh, now I want to talk a little bit about. Can I ask about, a question? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What about what? What about fractal structures? There, do you ever have to worry about that? Um, are you talking about some fractal structure in the texture or in the shapes yes. that we? Well, this this thing, this uh, square on the right. Yeah. What if that had fractal structure, or do you uh, ever I have to worry uh, about that? Yeah, pink noise actually does have fractal structure um, in the sense that if you if you took pink noise to comprise like all possible frequencies, just imagine going down all the way to very, very low frequencies and all the way to very, very high frequencies. And if you, if you create pink noise that has the amplitude going as one over F for all of those frequencies, then in that limit where it includes all frequencies, it is actually a fractal. Uh, as you keep zooming in more and more, um, it, as you zoom in, that little segment, when you zoom in, is going to look like pink noise again. Um, but that's something that we don't have to like worry about specifically when we are um, um, studying this uh, camouflage detection. Um, the properties that we are interested in uh, are properties that can be analyzed at any particular level. So if there's a particular image that is being shown to you, you can work on the scale of that image without worrying about the fractal structure. When it gets to like really tiny details, the, it's either there's like pixels, so you, it, that those features don't show up anyway. The images that we have on the screen only have a limited range of frequencies, so it's not a real fractal. Um, plus, tiny details would not really be picked up by the visual system anyway. Um, okay, so um, so the way that the experiment looks is that uh, we have a human being in a dark room, and on a screen we have images like this come up. And some of them randomly are going to have uh, this independent circular target on it with an independent sample of pink noise, and others are not going to have that. And the, and the, and the human subject is asked to indicate whether or not they saw, uh, saw the target. Um, so if you think about it, what determines the difficulty of a task like this? Even though the target has the same brightness, contrast, color, it's grayscale, and texture as the background, in different trials, the amount of mismatch at the boundary is going to be different. I picked a picture where- I have a short question. Uh, oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I never, I, I tried to figure out how you actually combine these two pictures. So you have two independent one over F noise pictures, and then you cut out from one picture as a circle and you add it to replace whatever was in there by this circle. Yeah. So that, okay, that's it. That's how you create them. Yeah. Okay. That's exactly how we uh, how I create this. Um, okay. So I have picked a picture here where the amount of mismatch at the boundary is very prominent, but in some pictures is there's not a lot of mismatch. So you might be tempted to say that there's no target. So that's what determines the difficulty of the task. Um, so we can see that this information at the edge is the primary source of information in a task like this. So we would start by wanting to you know, quantify this amount of information. And so how do we do it? Uh, the way we go about doing it is uh, first computing the image gradient. So um, this green arrow here is the vector that signifies the gradient on the two-dimensional image. It just basically goes from um, dark to light. And the white arrow is the component of that gradient, which is normal to the target value. Um, and so we can compute these gradients all along the target boundary. And we come up with something called the edge vector. Some of these gradients are pointing inwards because the inside is brighter than the outside. Some of them are pointing outwards. And accordingly, you get some positive and negative values in the edge vector. So the edge vector basically quantifies the amount of the edge or gradient information along the target boundary, all along the target boundary. And so this is still a vector. And what we can do is we can, we can extract a single number from the vector, which we are calling here the edge power. It's basically the mean squared value of the edge. We don't really care at this point if the edge is pointing upwards or inwards. So we take the average squared value of the edge that serves as a one number summary of how conspicuous the target should be against the background. Okay. So uh, what we see next is if we draw the distributions or if we plot the distributions of the edge power 
of the blank images. The blank images are the images which do not have a target on them. The target images are the ones which do have the circular target on them. We see that the edge power measure um, is able to separate these two distributions by a pretty large uh, separation. So um, this number, the D prime is what measures this separation is actually just the uh, di difference between the means of these distributions in units of their average standard deviation. So it, it just says that the blank and target distributions, if you measure their edge part, they're separated by 8.7 standard deviations. And if they're separated by 8.7 standard deviations, what you can do is you can um, put a criterion um, down the middle. Uh, the optimal criterion to put is actually where the two distributions cross. And then you can create a very simple detection model, which whenever the edge power is greater than this, it says target. And whenever it's less, it says blank. And if you use a simple detection rule like that, it would be 99.9993% correct. And so every value of D prime, or which is also called the discriminability or sensitivity index, reflects a value of accuracy that you would have in separating out the signal from the noise distributions. And this is the signal distribution, this is a noise distribution. Okay, so this is a very simple computational detection model, yet it has very high accuracy. Okay, but this is not all that the edge power gives us. Um, if we plot how it sorts the images, this is an example of a blank image, which did not actually have a target on it. And these are examples of images that all have targets on them. And as you can see, the edge power measure sorts them in what we can call a reasonable sequence or reasonable order of detectability. So each of these things have a target on them. So it seems that the edge power is able to capture quite a bit of the useful information about whether or not a camouflage target exists there. So um, since the edge power can kind of sort these images by detectability, what we can do next is we can design what is called a psychophysical experiment in which, uh, remember the experiment that we were doing where we were presenting humans randomly with these images. And in an experiment like this, what we can do is we can first present them with images that have high edge power and compute their performance then lower the edge power a little bit and so on, and just chart their performance as we change edge power. And we get a plot like this. These are three experimental subjects. And uh, on the vertical axis is the percentage of uh, trials that they got correct. And uh, the, the stimuli that were presented to them were divided into 10 bins of edge power. And when the edge power is very um, high, you can see that all of the subjects are almost 100% correct. And when the edge power is very low, they go down to chance, which is 50%, it's like a coin toss uh, probability. Um, and then what we can do is we can fit the, this performance with these curves called psychometric functions, they're sigmoidal curves. And so what that gives us is a kind of crude uh, prediction model which predicts the ability of humans to detect camouflage targets as a function of this edge power measure that we can measure on um, the images. Um, so this is an example of an experiment where we can titrate the amount of information uh, that's uh, available for detection, and we can calculate what is called a detection threshold. These are the vertical lines that you can extract from these fits, and it, they are basically kind of a measure of what is the value of edge power at which the targets just start to become visible? Um, and the reason that this is called a psychophysics experiment is because you're computing a psychological quantity, something like a detection threshold that's in your head, um, using physical measurements. Um, okay, so, um, and there are ways that we can also get some confidence intervals and error bars uh, around. Uh, one thing that um, we should note at this point is if we used just our simple detection model that uses the edge power, if we just had the computer do it, its performance would be way better than the humans, even though it was a pretty simple detection model using edge power. Um, so in the field of artificial intelligence and computer vision, 
people often want to just build the best algorithm that will be the best at a certain task, um, which is kind of an important concept in our uh, project as well. We just want to do know what is the best that we can do. But that's not the only thing that we're interested in. We are actually interested in modeling what humans do. Um, OK, so I, at the I, bottom. Can mm -hmm. I ask a question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have humans do this. Yeah, so these how, how, uh, sub, subject one, subject two, subject three are three humans. So how do you account for their different ability to see things clearly? Yeah, so. Um, so one thing that you can see here is that there are parameters in this fit that account for differing performances. So if you chart the performances of different humans on psychophysics tasks, there are a couple of dimensions um, along which their performance varies. One of them is that they have different thresholds and the fit kind of accounts for that. And the other thing is that they have different sharpnesses with which uh, the thing kind of rises, kind of like a, uh, what is it called? It's like a, in statistical physics, you have like a, an order parameter and then like phase transitions that happen around it. So it's kind of similar to that. So there are, there are like generally like a couple of parameters um, and those parameters are able to fit that. So at this point, these are all descriptive fits. Um, towards the end of the talk, we are going to start getting into talking a little bit more about a more mechanistic, like a fuller detection model. And there, the parameters will once again be able to fit person-to-person -person differences. And, but in that case, those parameters are no longer going to be just descriptive parameters. They're going to have interpretations, like the amount of noise, decision noise that happens, um, et cetera. Um, OK, so the bottom line of this slide is that the edge power serves as a first baseline measure um, of uh, available information in an image. And we can use it to titrate experiments like this and compute thresholds. And we will later expand this measure of this model to include other measures. Um, OK, let's see. So here are some examples of experiments that we can now make. Um, and we can uh, compute thresholds. So this is an example where so we are basically measuring the detectability across varying conditions. So in this, this series of experiments, we varied the overall uh, luminance, uh, brightness, and contrast of the images. These are just some examples of what it looks like when you vary the brightness and the contrast. And we basically measured the detection threshold in units of edge power on a human subject. And what we can see is that for very low brightness and contrast, detection threshold is high, which means your detectability is poor. But as you keep increasing brightness and contrast, um, detectability improves, but then it kind of saturates. So beyond a certain point, it doesn't help to make the image brighter or more, higher contrast. Your ability to detect the target is going to remain the same. Um, um, and this is another example where we just made the target bigger. No surprises there either. As you keep making the target bigger, your ability to detect it keeps improving up to a certain point, And then beyond that, your performance saturates again. Um, this is another series of experiments where we uh, increase the amount of time for which the picture is available on the screen and then disappears before you make a decision. And uh, so what we see is that once again, as we have, uh, as we can, when we can see the picture for longer periods of time, our ability to detect it correctly increases, but only up to a certain point after which it saturates. And um, the vertical line that I've marked here is the average human fixation duration. What that means is that if you are just looking around a scene, then what humans do is they go from point to point, and these things are called saccades. So they saccade from point to point. And when they go to a certain point, they look at that or basically absorb the information um, for some amount of time, and they move on to the next point. And the average, duration for which you are um, resting at a point is 250 milliseconds or humans. And what we see here is that about beyond that time period, it doesn't help um, for you to be staring at that point longer. So your detection doesn't get any better. If it did, it would make sense to fixate at different points longer. So it's kind of consistent with the average fixation duration of Can humans. I ask you, can I ask mm -hmm. you a question? 
did you do these experiments or these yeah are these are on me actually but we are uh collecting data on some additional subjects also yeah so wherever you see subject one subject one is myself um okay this is an example where there are two subjects so, uh, so far, we have been talking about experiments where the camouflage target is right at the center of your viewing field, and that's called the fovea. That's where our resolution and equity is highest. Um, but when you're actually out in nature, a camouflage target is not going to present itself right at the center. So it's kind of interesting to see how would detectability vary if you went away from the center. So uh, this is an experiment at which we vary the angle of the target from the fovea. And we saw how detection thresholds um, go up. Um, and um, nothing very surprising here, but uh, yeah, so we collected data on two subjects here. Um, and so normally camouflage detection in nature is actually not a detection task, it's a search task. There's a distinction between the two. Detection is where you're told that if the target is there, it's gonna appear here and just tell me whether or not you see it. And um, search task is more complicated than that, but detection is kind of like a subset of the search task. And looking at what your detectability is at different points away from the phobia is a step towards giving you more information about how effective you would be at searching because sometimes the target appears like, you know, you see it out of the corner of your eyes and then you move your eyes there and say, oh, is it there? Um, okay, so uh, now it's time to talk about a little little fun application um, that we can do using the edge power. So the edge power measure. So the edge power can also be used to calculate good and bad hiding spots for a target. So if this object hides against this background at all possible different locations and orientations, this is the distribution of all, all possible edge powers that it can have. So here are three copies of the same object that I will use to illustrate three different hiding scenarios. So first of all, if it's an animal camouflaging in nature, it would usually just land at a random location and orientation. Then most of the time it would just end up with the average edge power. This is kind of like the average is scenario. So this, this, this just gives you an example of where the target goes and puts itself at a location orientation at which it has the most probable or the average. However, you can imagine deliberate applications um, such as a drone. And I imagine this drone flying above a uh, terrain and on top, it has some kind of a pattern that mimics the pattern of the terrain. And it has downward pointing cameras through which it can image the terrain. And what it wants to do is it wants to land at a location and orientation that will make it hardest to spot from above. So um, what it can do is it can calculate its edge power across different locations and orientations, and then it lands, this is the second example, at the location orientation at which it minimizes its edge bar. So you can see that it becomes uh, quite undetected. Um, on the other hand, you can think of the extreme other example where it wants to become maximally visible from above for whatever reason, wants to be retrieved or rescued, so it can move to the location and orientation that maximizes its edge power. So this is just a little bit of an aside uh, which kind of describes that using even a simple metric like the edge power, you can, you can use it for some applications like um, um, hiding using camouflage. Okay, so now uh, we wanna expand our edge power measure a little bit. And so if you remember the edge vector, so far we have only been used, we have only been using the total edge power of the edge vector. But there is more information available here that we haven't used yet. So for example, for even for the total edge power, um, what can happen is sometimes that edge power can become clumped together um, along like uh, some little region of the boundary like you see over here. And we know that the human visual system is sensitive to little edge contours like this, where you have some continuity in the, in the gradient. And the human visual system is able to pick up uh, those edge contours. So um, this is some source of information that is definitely used by the visual system that is above and beyond the total edge power. So we wanna know how distributed versus clumped is, this, um, is the, this edge information. 
So we would like to quantify this as well. And one way of going about it is to look at, once again, the power spectrum. So we take this edge vector and we Fourier transform it to get the power spectrum, which tells us the power at the different frequencies. And um, this image that you see over here, the faint blue lines are basically the power spectrum of edges across a whole ensemble of blank images where there was actually no target. And um, the blue is the dark blue is their average. The faint red lines are power spectra of um, edges where there was a target and uh, dark red is their average. And so when there is clumping of the edge information, what we expect is that the low frequency, the more undulating uh, components will be stronger in amplitude, as opposed to when the edge power is just distributed and the amplitude is supposed to be a little bit more flat. And we do see that when there is an actual target, not only is the total edge power higher, we already saw that, but the low frequencies are actually more dominant. They are actually like way, way more dominant because the note that the vertical axis is a logarithmic axis over here. So we can use this statistical distribution um, as an independent measure. I'm not going to go into the details of this, of how to compute this, but you can basically compute the mean and standard deviation of the power at each frequency for the blank images and the target images. And then given any new image, you compute the edge power spectrum and you can compute a likelihood ratio of which, which um, distribution it belongs to. And that serves as a single number. Um, and we are calling that the edge power spectrum variable. And you can use this edge power spectrum variable, which measures how clump clumpy the edge power information is to separate the blank and target distribution. So this is an alternative measure. Yeah. Can I ask you a quick question? Mm -hmm. It seems like if you start with a circle, which is a very symmetric object, yeah, that may not be the best uh, image to use. Why not start with some something with a kind of random edge? Yeah. So um, that's one of the dimensions along which we can make things simple or complicated. Um, so what we want to do is when we start off um, with a project like this, we want to control as many um, and simplify as many factors as possible until we have some pretty well-controlled starting point, which still gives us a lot of rich complexity. So there is still a lot of rich behavior and rich stuff happening here that we want to characterize pretty well first. And then we want to um, kind of upgrade or extend our studies to include uh, complex shapes like this. So for most of our presentation, most of the presentation today, I'm gonna to be talking about circular targets at a known location, but at the end, I'm gonna be talking about some ongoing uh, part of this work where we start to make the target kind of complex. Um, so we see that uh, using the edge power spectrum information, you can separate the blank and target images with some degree of discriminability, not as good as what the edge power was giving you, but still this is independent information. So since this is independent information, we can combine these two measures. And so this is what that shows you. Um, the edge power was giving us this D prime. The edge power spectrum is giving us this D prime for, as an example. But we can look at the two dimensional space of their joint distribution. Um, so this is a space at which you plot both of those measures. And what you can do, the cool thing you can do is instead of discriminating either in this space of a scalar or this space of a scalar, you can discriminate using a two dimensional boundary in this space of two variables. And that's what uh, uh, this is. Okay, so I, I'm gonna go into this a little bit because what is being used here is a method, a mathematical method and open source MATLAB toolbox that we developed to, um, to help solve this problem. And it has applications in vision science, but also wider applications. So what this uh, mathematical method and um, toolbox does is just, just to kind of walk you through this, it first fits bivariate normal distributions to the observed data. 
of the two variables. And once it has this bivariate normal distributions, you can analytically calculate what would be the best boundary to discriminate between them. And these are quadratic boundaries. And once you have that boundary, you can compute what would be the probability of classifying a, an observation from the orange distribution as being actually orange, et cetera. So these are the four um, classification errors or the outcomes, the true positive, false positive, true negative, and, um, and false negative. So these four probabilities require you to compute the probability of multivariate normal distribution in some arbitrary space. And this is what our mathematical and uh, computational methods allow you to do. And once you do that, you can compute the discriminability in this two-dimensional space, which is how much discriminability do you get if you're in the joint space of the two variables. Um, in addition to this stuff, um, our methods can do some other stuff, like we can compute the, um, what is it? Yeah, we can, we can compute the normal probability in any domain, in any dimensions, uh, where the normal multivariate normal has any parameters. We can also compute the PDF, the probability density function, cumulative distribution function, and inverse cumulative distribution function of any function of a multivariate uh, normal variable. Um, uh, and what we see over here, bottom line is that the D prime, when you use both of those variables, is greater than using either one of those. Um, so another cool thing that you can do is that you can combine these two variables into one. Um, and this is what this shows you. So you basically used a method to combine these two variables into a single variable. And now you're back to a single variable, but now you, your single variable, which we can call the edge variable because it combines the R and power spectrum, is able to discriminate the target and the blank images with the same level of discriminability as in the two-dimensional uh, case. So this is an example of what might be called a dimension reduction, reducing the number of dimensions that you're using or number of variables in a problem. Um, so although our initial um, reason for going into this and developing these methods was to solve a vision science problem, um, it has, since we published this paper, uh, it has had a wider applications in, uh, fields outside. So for example, it has been used for problems in the global navigation satellite system. That's the system of satellites that are constantly transmitting position and time information to help like um, navigation and GPRS and things like that. Uh, it has been used for problems in signal detection in systems of antennas and radar. Uh, it has been used for computing the probability of collision or near miss of objects in space and also um, for probabilistic planning in robotic navigation. Okay, so that was like a little bit of an uh, aside. Uh, now back to camouflage detection. All right, so now we're gonna talk about an experiment about detecting larger scale edges. So, so far we have used um, an edge or like a gradient along the boundary of the target. And when you're computing the gradient of a function, you can either compute it at a very fine scale or at a coarser or larger scale. And so far we have been using the gradient that's computed at a very fine scale. And the question is, is that all that the humans are using for detection? So to answer this question, we repeated the experiment, but we hit the boundary region, the kind of narrow boundary region on which this edge power was being computed. Um, so what we see, is that when the boundary is hidden, performance drops substantially. So this edge power or edge power spectrum measure that we have uh, computed on this narrow region actually reflects a lot of the uh, important information that the human subject is using for detection. But we do, that, we do see that there is some residual performance. And so the question is, how does uh, that work? Um, so, here is another picture that should make it a little bit clearer. We see that even though the region over which the edge power was being computed is completely hidden, you can be pretty sure that there is a camouflaging target here. And the reason is that uh, pink noise, like many other natural textures, have uh, continuity 
across space. And the presence of this target was breaking that continuity, not just at this fine scale, but also at this larger scale. And we know that the human visual system have, is able to detect such discontinuities or these edges at multiple different scales, not just uh, at a fine scale. So the next thing that we would like to do is uh, improve or extend our model or our measure to incorporate edges at larger scales too. Um, okay, all right. So this is how we go about doing it. A, I just gave you an example of how you can combine the edge power and edge power spectrum information. These are two cues into one. And we're gonna basically follow the same thing. So, so far, we have looked at the edge power at a fine scale, one pixel scale, and we see we have some discriminability. Um, but now we can compute the edge power at two pixel. For the same image, we get two numbers. And we can look at their joint space, and we see that the joint distributions are pretty correlated, meaning that whenever an image has a strong fine scale edge, it also has a strong coarser or larger scale edge. But it, there is some level of independence in these two, so that if you're using the both of the variables for discrimination in this joint space, your D prime goes up a little. And you can keep adding larger scales. So this is a picture where you have added a four pixel uh, scale as well. And you're discriminating in the space of three hues um, and your D prime goes up um, even more. You can keep doing this. This is a picture where you're combining edge information at four different scales. Four dimensional plots are not possible. So what this is doing is it's using the method that we mentioned to combine the, the discrimination in the four dimensional space into and collapse it or project it into a single uh, dimension. Um, so this variable that we have can be called the combined edge power at four scales. And using this uh, decision variable, you can once again improve your detectability. Uh, you can kind of keep playing games like this. So uh, we talked about combining the edge power and edge power spectrum information. So you can do that at each scale and then combine all of those across the three scales. So uh, you can ignore the green boundary over here. So this is, for example, the two pixel edge power and power spectrum combined. This is the four pixel edge power and power spectrum combined. This is the eight pixel edge power and power spectrum combined. And then you're further combining those three. And you can, so basically what it means is that now um, you can also um, use the joint space of all of these six variables. So edge power and edge power spectrum at three different scales, let's say. And you can discriminate using uh, all of those six variables and you can project it down to a single variable. So these are just different examples of things that you can do with the methods that we have developed. Um, okay, so uh, this is another uh, kind of uh, technique which helps to account for the edge information that is spread across different scales. So remember how we generated the pink noise images. We take white noise, then Fourier transform to its amplitude spectrum, and then we multiply it by one over F, inverse Fourier transform, and we get pink. And what this process does is it starts with an uncorrelated signal and makes it correlated. And we can run this backwards. It's a completely invertible function. And then what it does is it would take the pink noise and make it into the corresponding white noise image. And this process is called whiting. The interesting thing is what happens if you start with one of our camouflage images, it's not a pure pink noise image because there's this independent circular target and you whiten it. What we see is that it becomes mostly random Gaussian white noise everywhere, except we get this very fine edge-like feature all along where the target boundary is. And this is interesting, and we kind of understand the theory of why this happens. My thesis kind of explains the mathematical theory behind this. But this is kind of interesting because what this means is, um, since this is a simple linear operation that is lossless, it has losslessly changed all of the information that was available in this image into this image, but most of this is now random white noise. 
So all of the usable information has now been concentrated into a little fine edge along the target boundary. And so the information is not spread across multiple scales. In. The texture has been decorrelated and all of the information that you could use to detect the kind of plus stimulus is now in a fine, fine edge along the target boundary. So it was interesting for us to ask, what if you gave humans these images, how would they perform? So we did that experiment. And uh, so uh, the blues uh, are the original pink noise image and the reds are the whitened image. And interestingly, we see that human performance on the whitened images um, stay the same. So we haven't thought a lot about what the consequences or the interpretation of this experiment is, but generally what we can say is that even though the information was present differently in the two images, in one case it was kind of spread out across multiple scales, in the other it's not, in both cases it seems like the human subject is able to leverage all of the available information to kind of the same uh, capacity. Okay, um, now we want to move on from this pink noise texture, talking about some other textures. So, um, in this experiment, what we did was we varied the camouflage texture across this family of filtered noise textures. So I talked about how pink noise is a texture where the amplitude falls off as one over frequency, but this general family is where it falls off as any power of frequency. Um, so when gamma equals one, you have pink noise. And as you keep lowering gamma, on the left is, when, it, when gamma is zero, it's completely uncorrelated white. And so completely uncorrelated white noise is like perfect camouflage. There's no correlated information. So if there's white noise target on top of white noise background, you're just going to be completely at chance. There's no available information there. And on the right, as gamma goes up, uh, the lower and lower, lower frequencies become more and more dominant and get smoother and smoother textures. Um, this is an important dimension along which to look at detection. Because although I said that natural images on average have one over F spectrum, uh, there has been some more new work that has shown that actually there is a range of this exponent. And it varies somewhere around 0 0.8 to 1.5 for natural images. Um, so this experiment gives us an idea of how detectability would vary across um, the different exponents that you would see uh, in nature. And what we see is uh, for the different subjects, on average, what we can say is that detectability starts going from just above chance to nearly perfect uh, around in the same range, like about 0 0.8 to slightly above one. So the interesting conclusion to draw here is that this is the same range of exponents that is seen in nature. So humans cannot detect maximally camouflage targets for exponents that are just below the range that occurs in nature. Um, and we repeated this experiment at various different angles from the center. Um, and we see that uh, this is how the threshold gamma goes up, meaning that the, the threshold of smoothness of the texture at which you just begin to be able to see the camouflage image. Um, so together, this variation across the texture exponent and angle from the center cover a kind of pretty relevant range of possible camouflage detection conditions. Okay, so next we have, this is kind of just more fun. Uh, so now we actually go towards more uh, realistic, naturalistic textures. And so there, there is an algorithm uh, with which you can take an image of some texture and then you can use the algorithm to generate many, many, many random samples of this, which is what we use to generate the stimuli for these experiments. Um, and so you can see that this are the performance curves for up to three subjects. In some cases, I didn't get data on more than one subject or two subjects across these different naturalistic textures. And um, the big blue, percentage is uh, once you have this fix, what you can do is you can compute what the overall average detectability would be 
for uh, uh, human if they were presented with randomly appearing camouflage targets. And what I've done here is I have ordered these images from the most detectable to the least detectable. And the pictures that you see over here are examples of some of the most detectable targets in those textures. So subjectively, if you look down these images, it actually kind of corroborates this percentage numbers that you see over here. Uh, this is like quite detectable, is not so detectable. So this is an application where uh, you can use some of these models to, to rate different textures for their ability of camouflage. Um, and these histograms, once again, are basically the histograms of the edge powers of the blank distribution and the target distribution. It's kind of useful to plot these because you see that if you have a target, if you have a texture, let's say this leather texture, for which these two histograms are very close, you could expect that, oh, it would be hard to discriminate the two. And we do kind of see that in this case, but that's not always true. For example, you see this foliage texture, the distributions of edge power are more different, but overall performance is worse for humans. And what this indicates is that the edge power at one pixel here is not all of the information. There is information beyond that. So in the case of the foliage, for example, so the edge power, what it does is it only computes what the gradients are along the true target boundary. But when the human visual system is presented with a picture like this, there's extra stuff happening. You see that this texture has internal edges. And so these internal edges, the edges of these little foliage things, disrupt your ability to detect what the true target boundary is. And that is not an effect that is captured by just measuring the edge power along the true target boundary. So this is kind of uh, interesting uh, to look at. Um, Can I ask a quick question? Yeah. yeah. You, you only had one or two humans doing yeah. the observations, like you did it. Yeah. It would seem that humans from different cultures and different quality eyesight and uh, yeah. artistry and et cetera would see things differently. So do you really have a good enough human sample? Yeah, so um, that's a question that actually comes up pretty frequently in this uh, kind of research. Um, and I'm gonna mention a couple of like sort of key points. One thing is that the level at which we are trying to understand what are the useful cues in an image for detection and what are the biologically plausible computations that are happening are um, computations and information that are at a low enough level that we expect that those things should be pretty conserved from one human to another. Um, and it has been seen that when you look at, uh, you know, kind of simple like detection experiments like this, one subject to another is like fairly consistent. Uh, okay, so a broader answer to that question is, since we are kind of limited by amount of time and amount of data that we can collect, so for the same amount of data, there are two approaches that we can take. We can either collect data on a lot of different subjects, um, and we would not be able to collect as much data on each one of them. So smaller amount of data on a large number of subjects versus what we can do is we can take like just a couple of different subjects, two or three, and collect much more detailed data on them across many different uh, conditions and be able to collect enough data so that the error bars on their performance get narrower. Um, in the first case, if we collect small data on a large number of subjects, what we can do is basically average their performances together. And in that case, what happens is that we get some like descriptive, some description of what a population does on average, but that kind of washes out a lot of the, a lot of the particularities. And what you end up with is kind of like an average performance and no individual human is like that average because important dimensions kind of get averaged out. On the other hand, the kind of uh, approach that we have is where we collect very detailed data on a couple of different subjects. And then we have detailed models that try to make detailed predictions of their performance across all of these things. Uh, but there is interpersonal variation. And so we do have some parameters in our models which account for this person-to-person -person variation. So, 
when we do this, where we have a detailed model predicting detailed data with parameters that is flexible to account for person-to-person -person variations, that ends up giving us much more revealing insight into this kind of early stage visual processes than if we collected small data on a lot of different subjects. Um, okay, so, all right. So this is also something fun. This is ongoing work. Uh, this is to answer your question, Dr. Reichel, you asked initially if, you know, uh, we are looking at um, um, shapes that are not circular. Um, so here, this is some ongoing work where we are looking, starting to look at how hard would it be to detect targets that are not circular. And every image that you see is, is a random shape. So you don't know what uh, the next shape is going to be. And what we see over here, okay, the first thing that I should say is that the way that these shapes are generated is kind of similar to the way that the textures are generated. Remember that the textures are filtered noise. So there is a parameter there, which is the exponent, which was determining how smooth versus irregular the texture is going to be. So the texture is a two-dimensional function where you can control the irregularity. And in a similar way, you can think of the shape as being a a one-dimensional function of radius versus the angle. And you can generate um, shapes in a similar way where you basically generate a one-dimensional noise signal and then control its smoothness. And so these shapes are generated in, in, in that kind of way. And if you have a very low shape exponent, it's the, the boundary is gonna be very jagged. It's basically like white noise boundary. And as you increase the, the exponent, they become like smoother and smoother. So these are just outlines of these shapes. These are not what the, the, the actual experimental stimuli is where they have the same texture as they have. So now we have an idea of what these shapes look like. And you can see that when the shape is more smooth, it's a little bit easier to detect this smooth boundary running across this noise texture. When the shapes are too jagged, you can once again see these like little jagged things. But when it is kind of in the middle, Interestingly, when the irregularity of the shape is the exact same as the irregularity of the texture, they have the same ex exponent, is when the performance seems worst. So it's kind of an interesting synesthetic result in that the irregularity of the shape seems to interplay with the irregularity of the texture, such that when they're matched, your performance is worse. Um, there is quite a lot of variability here. And uh, we are not yet sure that this is a result that like truly holds across multiple different texture exponents. So we wanna, uh, we, are, we keep working on this. Okay, so now we're kind of drawing to a close. This is still work that we are doing. So far, we have kind of talked about some developments of the measures and the modeling that we're using. And at the moment, what we are trying to do is we are trying to expand our modeling towards a kind of fuller detection model um, that tries to follow the human visual uh, detection process a little bit more closely. Um, and so um, we know, for example, that what the human visual system does in a situation like this, it detects edges and it finds edge contours. And so we can use a standard edge detection um, algorithm um, to detect the edges in the image and then separate, it, separate them out into um, edge contours that it thinks are in the, in the boundary region versus edge contours that are just in the, in the texture. And then what it can do is you can, you can compute multiple different properties of these edge contours, like how long they are, um, how sharp they are, et cetera, and then look at what is the difference between these yellow guys in terms of these properties versus the blue guys, and then have a probability model, which tells you how probable is this, that this is like an actual edge versus an edge that would appear just because of the, uh, the texture and so on. So this is a fuller model that we are working on currently. And then once we have this model, this fuller model, we want to fit this to the experimental data that we have across many different conditions, across different subjects. And we have a couple of param parameters in the model that should fit each subject differently. It has to do with the amount of noise um, that is introduced at different stages of this visual detection and computation. 
Okay, so summary. Um, so we've kind of developed a, a principled way to study human camouflage detection. The two main principles are that we want to build models that are based primarily on what are the available information and cues in the image and what are the plausible computations on them. And then we also want to in parallel measure human detection across different conditions and the models inform the experiments, the experiments inform for the building of the models. This is something that is kind of happening in tandem. Um, the ongoing work is, uh, as I described, to build a more detailed model that follows human detection mechanisms and fit it to performance data across all of the textures. So we would like this more detailed model to be able to predict correctly human detection performance across all of these different textures. Um, so finally, I would like to um, thank uh, my advisor, Bill. He, he has been like a really great advisor uh, and also his group for all the support. Um, thanks a lot to my committee uh, for their support as well. And also my family and friends uh, for showing up. And uh, we would also like to thank the NIH for funding this research. So I guess we can, I can take some questions now. I've already asked a lot of questions. Somebody else should do it. Yeah, maybe we should uh, ask uh, if there's any, any of the people who are, um, you know, listening guests um, here would like to ask questions now because the committee can ask some more questions once we're, um, alone with uh, the candidate. Uh, I have a question just as a, a matter of curiosity. Uh, yeah. So, Neil, you had mentioned that, um, you know, natural images have this range of uh, exponents from 0.8 to 1.5 or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Have, have y'all considered doing a study where you randomly draw an exponent based on the distribution, you know, some distribution that uh, is modeled on natural images? So presumably the, the natural images have some distribution in this exponent. Yeah. You could randomly yeah. draw the texture of both the image and the target uh, so that there would be some possibility of a slight mismatch. And, uh -huh. uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's something that we, uh, we have actually thought about is, uh, so, so far we have had so there's, a, there's two things that you're talking about here. One is uh, varying the texture exponent. And we could uh, design an experiment at which the texture exponent is being varied from trial to trial, but the target has the same exponent as the background. So that's, that's one. And if we did that experiment, mm -hmm. what would happen is uh, there would be just more variability. And in some cases, we want to do a more controlled experiment where fewer variables are changing so that we can kind of pin down the performance more. Um, the right. other thing that I should, uh, the, the other thing is when the target has a slightly different um, texture exponent than the background. That's also something that we have thought about. So in the beginning, we kind of committed ourselves to looking at camouflage in the hardest case because that's really the most challenging question is when it exactly matches the background. But I think it would be a pretty easy extension to the work we have done to slightly vary the texture of the target. Kind of on either side, this is something that I kind of proposed, is you take the texture exponent of the target and vary it on either side of the background. And then you have a two-dimensional performance chart where you basically look at how does the performance vary as you deviate from, as the texture, as the exponent of the target deviates from the background exponent. And that's something that would be interesting to look at. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? I don't know if I should be. <laughs> running this or not, uh, but uh, let's, uh, if somebody else has a question, uh, now is the time to ask. And if not, uh, then we'll, I guess we'll uh, ask all of the 
folks who are not on the committee to, um, to uh, log off. Yeah, so those of you who are uh, unfamiliar with this part, this is where my panel is gonna be asking you questions. So uh, everyone that's not on my committee needs to leave this Zoom call. Otherwise I, I'm gonna have to keep Oh, but and you're gonna then, it. you're gonna turn off the recording too. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So let me see how the, how does that work? So, sorry guys.